Hello everybody! So, it's been a little bit of time since I last posted a video and uh, been busy actually learning a lot more music. So, uh, focusing on keyboard, organ, and uh, piano primarily, so it takes up a good bit of time to try and uh, learn those skills. But anyway, back at uh, doing the music theory, and so what we're going to do is we're going to, as you see I started a timer here, we're actually going to go for a particular amount of time. These are going to be unscripted videos because this is essentially my my practice time, if you will, uh, when I get to practice speaking to you uh, in the camera. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with that just yet. And also just learning my, uh, my video production software. So using OBS uh, so software, I've got um, got my little app pulled up here, so I've got my MIDI keyboard, and you can see. So we'll be able to do some musical examples just using the electric um, piano. Um, what else? Everything else is pretty much the same. Uh, so what we're going to do is in these videos, as you see, it'll, each one will be 20 minutes long. And what what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, a particular music theory book. Uh, and just take it page by page, concept by concept, um, try and um, read the material to the best of my ability. Um, that way I can practice hearing my own voice in my ears, which is something else, and um, learn how to try and convey the information as clearly as possible. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to go ahead and take a look at where we can find these music theory books. Obviously, you can buy used copies if you were on uh, um, thriftbooks.com or abooks or Amazon. You know, there's so many, so many different versions. Uh, but for my particular taste, I like to use some of the older, the older music theory books. I've really been enjoying the process of using uh, Google's digitized library they've been they've worked with various uh, libraries to bring out of out of uh, copyright books into their digitized their digitized form and putting them on Google they've been doing it for quite a few years now um, you can use it for anything you can use it for music theory as we are going to be using it for grammar history um, sky's the limit really so, without further ado, let's go ahead and see how we can find these books, okay? So, what you want to do first is you want to go ahead and uh, refine your search engine so that it's not the general uh, um, Google algorithm. You're using a specialized version which is looking just for text, okay? So, uh, Control L on your keyboard opens up your um, search bar at the top of the screen. Once, once it's open, we're going to go to a website. As you see, it's already pulled up here, but we're gonna go ahead and type in, just so you can see it's books.google.com, okay? And so when you're in there, you're going to go ahead and you, you can either access books that you've um, um, started to work on previously, that's in my library, or you can uh, search for books here in the normal search bar. Okay, so we're going to do that. We're going to search for music theory. Music theory. There we go. Now, you'll see what comes up first are the most either... Uh, yeah, the most popular books or the newest books. As you see we have one by Steve Vai here, um, Music Theory for Dummies. So these are all books that you would either have to rent from a library or you have to buy. All right. So these are, it's already been, as I said, we have uh, filtered the general Google uh, um, search results down into just the text material. And now we want to further refine our search. So we're looking just for um, free, free material, essentially. And what it will end up being is the older books, because those are the um, out of print or the copyright, uh, the, uh, the books where the copyright has lapsed. The way that we get uh, to these books is we have to go, we can do it one of two ways. One of them 
is you see we have these different options. We have any view, any document, any time, and then we have an advanced search. So if you click on any view, notice we can have access. I'm just, you guys can see this. You can, good, good. So um, notice that you have any view, then you have preview and full view, and then you have full view. So if I click on the full view option, this, this further refines the books down until we are only looking at material that is available in its full content, okay? Notice that we have um, how many write off? Some of them are, are, are um, repeats, if you will, but a lot of these are unique books that served as the textbooks for colleges, universities. Um, a lot of these are from college libraries and universities, as you'll see. So we're going to take a look at the very uh, first, the very first book in the lineup, okay? Uh, and that is *The Principles of Music Theory* by Rene Longhi Michel. And I'm sure I butchered the name. I'm sorry. Um, I, we're not studying French here. We're studying music. So we have this book here, okay? And so it's it's the full PDF. As you can see, we have here where's our page count there we go page count this is 101 pages of music theory then and these are the principles of music theory you see this was published in 1925 by E.C. Shermer music company a um, reputable and relatively famous music uh, publisher so uh, what I would recommend is you could either read it here on the Google page or I prefer to download the PDF and then of course we have to enter a little captcha go and now we have now we have the book available to us okay so <clears throat> you can further download it um, so that it's local right now it's just in the or it's just in Google uh, or it's just in the Firefox browser, but then you could download it and then use um, Adobe Acrobat Reader or any of the various PDF readers um, that you so choose. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the book from the very start. Just kind of get used to this layout. Maybe for some of you, this is the first time using uh, Google Books in this, in this uh, manner, and it's just, it's it's so handy, it really is. So, as you see here, Principles of Music Theory by Rene. We'll call her Rene. Um, and this had multiple printings. Eight, the eighth printing was 1947. So, as you see, this particular book was copyrighted 1925, which is why it's available to us. So, to my solfege pupils, and especially to the medalists class of 1924. So, there you go. Um... We have our preface here. Sometimes it's useful to read through a preface just to kind of get a sense of who, uh, of what the book is about, um, especially if someone else is writing it. So you see here this preface, um, a knowledge of the elements of music. So we'll go ahead and read through it, all right? A knowledge of the elements of music is of the highest importance in music education. Too often, American students undertake the study of the higher branches of the art without first submitting themselves to a thorough drill in, in musical fundamentals. Conductors of amateur orchestras and choruses, as well as teachers of classes and individuals, are constantly balked by the lack of elementary knowledge on the part of their students, and this defect is made worse by the fact that we are forever seeking shortcuts to learning instead of making every effort to secure thoroughness. So you can already see this guy's coming off real hard. And who is this? This is Archibald T. Davison. Okay. So he's, uh, he, he came out of the gate swinging, I'll say. Everyone undertaking the study of music should acquire five indispensable possessions. First, an exact knowledge of the substance of music. Second, a well-trained ear. Third, the ability to do with the eye what is ordinarily done by the ear. Fourth, a thoroughly developed rhythmic sense, and fifth, a sound and discriminating musical taste. These are not only necessary to an intelligent appreciation of music and to a successful participation in it, but they are essentially prerequisites to the study of harmony. 
um, and the more advanced branches of music. It is safe to say that not one in a hundred American music students is in even moderate possession of these five details, and yet schools and music teachers continue to offer inadequate fundamental instruction, hoping, apparently, that intuition will supply the deficiencies. There ain't no model, uh, molly coddling with this guy, I'll tell you what. This book, therefore, will be gladly welcomed by conscientious teachers of music, for, its, for it presents in clear and definite form that information about music which is the most important step to a complete musical education. But to yield its full value, the material here presented should be supplanted by work in solfeggio and music appreciation, for only if supported by these will this book really prove effective to a student who wishes to participate in music or who wishes merely to be an intelligent listener. That's, that's you and me, or those who wish to be intelligent listeners. Students will find here more than an enumeration of facts about music, for the text is illustrated by a number of passages drawn from actual compositions. A knowledge about music is comparatively valueless unless one can apply that knowledge to music itself. The author of the book, a musician with long experience as a teacher, has devoted herself to reconciling the pedagogic, the pedagogic, gogic, pedagogic, we'll call it that, vagaries of our public school systems with the very exact methods of French teachers of musical fundamentals and her observations and efforts have resulted in this excellent work. To those who desire a clear, thorough, and systematic approach of the fundamentals of music, this book will make a marked appeal. And for teachers who seek a textbook for classes in elementary music, the present volume will appear as a real contribution to the literature of music pedagogy. Pedagogy. We'll call it that. All right? Archibald T. Davidson. So, what's the takeaway from this preface? Well, uh, this section here actually, um, where he talks about those five indispensable possessions. First, an exact knowledge of the substance of music, what the what the material, if you will, uh, uh, is that uh, music pertains to. Um, second, a well-trained ear, so in other words, the ability to discriminate between the various sounds that we hear. Third, the ability to do with the eye what is ordinarily done by the ear. What he means by that is being able to, with your eye to uh, be able to hear in your head uh, what the sounds ought to be. Okay? Um, this is, I mean, uh, to be honest, when he talks about that, the ability to do with the eye what is ordinarily done by the ear, uh, we, do that al we do that already when we're reading text, actually, when we're looking at this line of text here. Um, even though our, our eye is looking at those symbols, essentially our eye is translating those marks on the paper into phonemes in our head, and our brain is actually doing the processing of the sounds in our head, the phonetic uh, uh, um, uh, substance of language, if you will. So we're, we're essentially taking the ability to read uh, regular, um, regular text, if you will, um, literary text, and we're attempting to train our brains to do the same when it comes to musical notation, as we'll, as we'll see that that's the term used for it. All right, uh, what, what else do we have here? Fourth, a thoroughly developed rhythmic sense. So this is where you have an idea of what a pulse is when, um, when, it, when you hear uh, a structured uh, sound that follows a particular time duration, you know how to deal with that particular sound, you know how to subdivide it, you know how it fits into the broader scope of musical appreciation. Okay, uh, So that was our fourth. The rhythmic sense was fourth. And fifth, a sound and discriminating musical taste. So when he says sound and discriminating musical taste, what that means is that you understand what is a good application of a particular musical venture and what is a poor musical uh, a poor execution of a particular musical style okay um, 
So those are the five things which are really important to pay attention to, and it really doesn't matter what type of musician you are um, I- intending on uh, on uh, um, developing or what aspect of musicianship you are intending to develop. You should have these five elements. Uh, you'll hear many um, interviews, whether it's put out by Rick Beato, uh, his excellent interviews that he has with uh, with um, more modern or pop musicians, or whether you are listening to Adam Neely talk about uh, jazz um, or any of the classical uh, any any of the classical musicians, you'll notice that with those who are professional and those who uh, who really um, have poured themselves into this art, those five aspects of of music or those five uh, indispensable possessions, as Davidson calls them, are truly necessary for any branch of the art. Okay, and that is our preface. So hopefully this uh, whets your appetite for wanting to go through the rest of the book. If uh, his tone um, caused you to run away uh, um, screaming, or you know it was a, it was a little too hard, uh, just. Take a moment and think about your own experience in any sort of educational venture. It, um, it, did he speak the truth? You know, did he actually, is what he's saying, is it resonating, sorry, sorry is, it, is it resonating with your own experience? So consider that point. Now, moving on, let's now go ahead and see what we have here. So how much time have we got? Oh, we have three minutes left, so that'll be just enough time to go ahead and at least uh, look over our table of contents. So we have our preface, which we just went through. We have how many chapters? This is 16 chapters total, so we should be done in about six years. Kidding. Uh, so we have here chapter one. Our Chapter one, we deal with musical sounds and signs of intonation. Chapter 2, we deal with signs of duration. Chapter 3, musical abbreviations, uh, their notation and their and their effect. Chapter 4, time and time signatures, rhythmical values. Hopefully you guys can can. Very nice. Uh, chapter, so we were on chapter 4, time and time signatures, rhythmical forms. Chapter 5 deals with genders. Now, you know, this is genders in the scope of music, so it'll probably take on a slightly different uh, term than what you would be familiar with in its normal convention. Uh, we have whole and half tones, scales, tetrachords, order of sharps and flats. Uh, we then have chapter six, which deals with intervals. Chapter seven, triads, derivation, and formation of the scales. Chapter eight, it deals with neighboring scales and keys, formation of chromatic scales, major and minor modes. Chapter 9, musical instruments, voices, transposing and tempered instruments. Uh, chapter 10 deals with transposition. Chapter 11, origin of musical sound, tuning fork, metronome. Chapter 12, ornaments, embellishments. Chapter 13, principal chords and their inversions, harmonic and melodic progressions. Um, phrases, cadences, and passing notes. Chapter 14, words and signs applied to musical composition. Chapter 15, synopsis, general definitions in the order of their occurrence in the book. So chapter 15 looks like it also contains our glossary. Uh, And then chapter 16 is the general principle of musical interpretation. And that we're in our last minute. So in our last minute here, um, I'd like us to just... uh, you know, consider these terms. If most of these terms are unfamiliar to you, no problem. That's what each of these chapters goes over, is how or what these terms mean. And very often, if you can learn the definitions of a particular art, you are at least a quarter, if not a, if not a third of the way, uh, to actually learning the art itself. If you know how to speak intelligently um, in the language of the art, it, it will help you so much. So I, I hope that you follow me on this uh, journey through this book as I practice my uh, uh, presentation style. Hopefully by the end of it, I'll be, uh, I'll be a little bit more interesting um, and be able to explain these concepts as clearly as I can. Thank you very much for watching.